And I think probably the best place to start, as you kind of mentioned, is in March uh, this year, where um, women were exposed to very much the naked and brutal face uh, of the capitalist state. You know, as we know, following the murder of uh, Sarah Everard by a Met police officer, obviously thousands gathered uh, for these vigils. And obviously the most high, high profile one was in is uh, Clapham. And it, that was obviously violently interrupted by the brutality uh, of the police force. Um, and her murder actually also uh, inadvertently brought attention to a bill that was actually going through parliament at the same time, which was seeking to actually give the police greater power Hours, which itself was actually a reaction against the uh, previous summer's uh, Black Lives Matter uh, protest and also the kind of rise in environmental protests that have been popping up as well. And obviously, as we know, protests of this kind are actually going to become more intense and more frequent, as kind of highlighted on Friday by, by Rob, because of the state of capitalism. And therefore, the state is toughening up its kind of uh, repressive measures kind of in response. Uh, the Police Crime and Sentencing Bill uh, exposes that the police, and by extension, uh, the state are a weapon in the class struggle and they will use it against workers and young people challenging the capitalist system and its, and its inequalities. And it's a clear attack on the rights of activists and trade unionists. Obviously the Home Secretary is looking to introduce uh, basically uh, prevention orders, it's called a criminal disruption prevention order, which will uh, halt the movement of what Pretty Patel calls uh, prolific uh, offenders and it basically gives courts the power to prevent individuals with a history of uh, disruption uh, according to intelligence um, basically stopping them attending particular protests and actually stop uh, protesters from like targeting uh, certain uh, media organizations or if like you know uh, power stations or you know th things like that. Um, and disgracefully and unsurprisingly, uh, you know, Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer uh, has asked for and actually supports this extension uh, of police hours. But obviously, as we know, it's not just a tone deaf response, especially kind of in response to Sarah's murder. It's actually a shot fired in this ongoing class war. When we understand the state and the police as the armed wing of the state, uh, a tool used by the ruling class in the class struggle, this begins to make much more sense. It reveals the naked role of the state. Uh, the state and the police exist as a safeguard for the interests of the ruling class and the establishment, which are obviously increasingly coming under question. And obviously the events of the past year has raised many questions about the police and what to do about them. Obviously the bourgeois say we should strengthen the forces of the state, hence you've got the police and crime bill. And Others may say we need more diversity for the police or that we should hold police more accountable. Maybe they should wear body cameras. Uh, maybe they should have to sign in and out more rigorously. Uh, and maybe there should be kind of extra sensitivity training so they stop murdering people. Uh, but we see the police as actually it, it doesn't, you know, exist outside of the system that is misogynistic, that is racist and is exploitative uh, and it's part of that establishment. That's the function uh, of the state of which police is just one part. You know, we aren't, we aren't interested in actually making uh, the guard dogs of capitalism like a prettier or nicer uh, force. But at the same time, Marxists don't flippantly talk about abolishing the police without thinking about what kind of society we actually want to build uh, in its place and what will replace the bourgeois state. And that's kind of what I want to explore in this talk. Uh, today. And obviously the beauty of Marxism, and I hope we've kind of all gathered this from the weekend, is that it's not content with just seeing things uh, on the surface. Marxists want to uncover the deep and con even contradictory nature of things uh, under investigation, including uh, the state. So to understand the present day state, we must first look to kind of understand its origins and development. Uh, and the origins of the state are bound up with the origins of class uh, society. And I think that talk is going on currently. So I'm not going to go into too much uh, detail, but you should also read it in the latest issue of the In Defense Marxism journal. Uh, but this is like going to be a very kind of simple explanation of how the state arose basically as an institution. And obviously it's always worth stating and starting from the fact that we as humans have not always lived under a state. In prehistoric society, before the state and class divisions arose, uh, society was organized kind of communistically. Uh, things were produced communally and production and distribution were decided democratically. Uh, because of the low development of the productive forces, there was uh, no surplus being produced, only kind of the basic needs, means of survival to meet the needs of the community at that time. And equality was therefore a fact a fact of life. And this is not to say there was no violence or that it was a utopia, but simply that exploitation at that time did not exist or couldn't exist. Uh, these tribes would organize in self-defense from external threats if required, uh, but it was not as in the case with the modern day state, an armed and permanent public force. Uh, nor did war ever lead to subjugation by one people over another as it does today. 
But when humanity began to produce more than was necessary for its own maintenance, uh, that is a surplus, uh, those tribes that kind of ma mastered agriculture first in exchange uh, raised themselves above the rest of humanity. And it, uh, exchange increased between tribes and then between private uh, individuals. And that exchange in turn began to uh, kind of create the seed of commodity production and production for sale. And obviously money also arose to kind of aid that exchange. Uh, individuals began to cultivate their own land and obviously we have individual land ownership begin to emerge. Occupations kind of became divided and so you have a general division of labour became much more permanent and basically with more permanent uh, division of labour and occupations then you have common interests emerge between those groups. Uh, the increase in production also saw the increase of the amount of work done by each member of society which makes it kind of desirable and necessary to bring new labour forces to grow that surplus further. You know, prisoners of war were turned into slaves and forced to labour for whoever they were conquered by. Um, so we see for the first time an emerging class society which arose from the social division of labour uh, and that becomes a class society split between masters and slaves, exploited and exploiter. Um, with this economic de development, you also have an increasing density of the population, which creates at one point not only kind of common interests, but conflicting interests between separate communities. Uh, this aids the setting up of organs to safeguard common interests and combat kind of conflicting interests. And, you know, you also have uh, an increase and the concentration of that surplus into kind of ever fewer hands. Um, and this required the consolidation of uh, an internal and an external power based on basically territory, uh, military officials to preserve the existence and riches of this new ruling class, and a means of preserving the system that allows them to continue to get richer. Um, the military officials and armed forces became kind of a permanent fact uh, of life, with the conquest of other land and wealth providing them with basically a regular function. Uh, these new groups in society the slaves, the master and the state officials became ever more divided. Uh, it created a public force, it disarmed the people and divided people by territory. And with all of this came the establishment of political rights, often based on property ownership. And it was necessary so those in control of the in state, the state ensured that the state remained securely in their hands. And what we're talking about here is the development of an institution which not only secured newly acquired riches of individuals, but also kind of sanctified private property uh, and declared the sanctification to kind of be the like highest state of being um, an institution that recognizes um means of acquiring new wealth and property and amassing that wealth. Um, and as you know, and, and it also has to be an institution that perpetuates class divisions and sanctifies the right of the possessing class to exploit the non-possessing class and basically the rule of the former over the latter. And that institution is what we know as uh, the state. And so as we can see, the state is not a force imposed on society from nowhere. Uh, it is itself a product of society at a given stage of development. It is in itself a product of classes with competing interests. But in order that these classes, in the words of Engels, do not consume themselves in fruitless struggle, a power must stand above them, or at least appear to stand uh, above them and kind of moderate the conflicts between them. Uh, in order to maintain this public power, the state must then levy taxes, or kind of as is more common today, take on debt. Um, because of of the special nature of the state, uh, representatives of the state also stand above society and you know they're given uh, special powers by kind of decree which gives them kind of sanctity and inviolability. And obviously, as we know, the lowest uh, police officer of the state has much more authority than all uh, of the organs of the old communal forms of society put together. And as we know, the working population are currently only occupied with the labour that they had no, kind of no time left for looking after the common affairs of society. And obviously, as we know, that is very much deliberate. You know, the direction of like affairs of state, legal matters, art, science, they basically only exist for a special class within uh, society, as we kind of talked a little bit about yesterday. And you you know, they're freed from actual labour to basically manage these affairs. But this class acts in its own interest to impose a greater and greater burden uh, on the labour of the working masses to maintain that privileged uh, position. And so the state appears to stand above society, but it's in itself a, a the fact is that it's a product of the class struggle. Uh, and as such, it is a weapon in the hands of every society's ruling class, which acquires new means of exploiting and holding down the oppressed classes. 
um, the state is fundamentally an instrument in which the tiny minority rules over the vast majority. And with every kind of revolutionary change in society, such as the bourgeois revolutions, which overthrew feudalism and heralded uh, the, in the capitalist system, the state has changed. Obviously, the feudal monarch is very different from the democratic uh, republic. Um, social formations such as the state, which uh, kind of arise at, from society itself. They're not kind of chemically pure uh, bodies. They'll obviously have peculiarities of previous centuries or even like national quirks and so on. Um, but with each uh, bourgeois revolution, the state was kind of refined as a weapon of minority rule and kind of the state has uh, kind of reached its highest, I suppose, form under, under capitalism. And obviously, as we know, the capitalist state is different to, for example, a feudal state, but it does have some things in common. You know, we still have the monarchy, we still have the House of Lords in, uh, in this country. But in each case, the state is simply becoming a more refined weapon by which the minority oppresses the majority. Uh, under capitalism, the state kind of reaches that highest stage of refinement. And no longer does it need to rely just on naked force all the time to kind of hold the masses uh, in check. It kind of works through softer uh, measures such as the media, education and the corruption of officials, including in the labor movement as well. Um, the bourgeois state kind of represents the highest form of state in which kind of the majority rules over. Uh, oh, sorry. In which the. I've got it the wrong way around. Minority rules over the majority. And basically wealth makes its power known very much kind of indirectly. Um, it kind of corrupts officials and kind of sits in the pocket of big businesses and kind of the, the stock exchange and things like that. And obviously the bourgeois can swap out uh, parties. You know, they can go Democrat, Republican, Tories, Labour, and it can swap out leaders if they need to as well. And the state remains just as uh, secure. You had Andrew Cuomo in New York as governor. He had to step down because of a scandal. You had Stefan uh, Lufern, I think, I think is how you say it in Sweden. Um, and having these powers in different sources is actually like, is what protects the state. And in the, uh, you know, you can also kind of concentrate that power into kind of different uh, organs. You've got the police, you've got parliaments, uh, you've got political parties, you've got courts, and that makes a democratic state fundamentally the best option for, for the bourgeoisie. Um, but in spite of all the pretenses, the state and the police, despite what we're told, don't actually rule by consent but they have a monopoly on force, which can be used in the interests of the capitalist class. And even in more democratic forms, the state still represents the rule of one class over another. Um, and this is to quote Lenin, it says, it establishes its power so securely, so firmly, that no changes of persons, institutions, or parties in the bourgeois democratic republic can shake it. Um, and democracy provides an outlet for discontent while ensuring the continued uh, rule of the bourgeoisie. And while we're, we're allowed to vote and have some freedoms to protest which are being rolled back, it's not ultimately us who decide whatever is done. We're of course in favour of a democratic republic as the best form of state for the proletariat under capitalism, especially since many workers fought and died uh, for that right. But wage slavery is the lot of people, even in the most democratic republic. In terms of the everyday running of the state, naked violence therefore is kind of infrequent because uh, the bourgeoisie do continue to have uh, other means. As we say, and I kind of wanted to explore this thing about corruption of officials. Uh, again, you know, you got Boris Johnson when he was uh, London mayor. Uh, he gave uh, 43 million pounds of state money to kind of like private firms to build something called uh, the Garden Bridge uh, and it was never built and there is no evidence that it was ever going to be built and actually no plans of it actually remain so we don't even really actually know what it was ever going to look like uh, and that's just 43 million pound gone. Um, you also have the Marble Arch Mound which maybe you drove past if you came through Victoria Station uh, and obviously the Tory Council of Westminster gave a private firm six million pounds uh, to build basically what is glorified scaffolding covered in grass. Uh, and this was obviously rank corruption on uh, all levels. This is a huge redistribution of public funds into the pockets of private companies. And that's not even obviously the half of corruption within the state. And I'm sure in the discussion, maybe people have it, more examples. There's also uh, a revolving door between kind of big business and the civil service. So widespread that kind of every civil servant kind of really knows um, that if they make favorable decisions, it can kind of like lead to nice jobs uh, down the road. And, you know, how many politicians do we know of that have gone on to work in private, private financial firms once they leave their political career? Um, you've got David Miliband, who now works for Facebook, I guess Meta now, I don't know. Um, you've got Chukra Muna, went to go work for JP Morgan. And obviously David Cameron works for Greensill Capital and actually used his political connections to obtain preferential treatment for his client during the COVID crisis. 
And obviously, these are not the only way that this, like, you know, the state makes its power known or that the capitalists can use. Like, the state can also use the workers' organizations to secure their own rule. Uh, for example, in Sweden, um, Swedish social democracy is so closely linked with the bourgeois state. Um, in fact, much of kind of the bureaucratic apparatus of the party is actually pretty much the same that is used in the state. And frequently, the Social Democratic Party and the trade union, uh, I suppose, trade union congress, maybe you would say, um, have used the police and like the like armed wing of the state against the workers. Um, during World War One, the British Labour leaders, you know, so your TUC and your Labour Party, basically got in lockstep with the imperialist state and they agreed to cease all disputes and agreed not to strike and agreed also to help with the state's uh, recruitment effort. And that's actually depicted in, if anyone's watched Ken Loach's Days of Hope, uh, where a trade union official follows the military officer um, give, and he basically gives an impassioned speech uh, calling for people to sign up to uh, to fight in World War One, and in exchange, these leaders can expect honours from the Queen herself for uh, what is called services to the trade unions, uh, and it's basically a little gift for holding back the workers and keeping them in check. Um, and where needed, the labour movement does and will, and as we know, props up patriotism to legitimise the state, and it legitimises that uh, monopoly on violence. Um, in some countries, the state has other means, you know. In Poland or Ireland, the authority of the church can be used. Um, in Britain as well, you've got bishops, they can sit in the House of Lords. Although, of course, the power of religion, as we know, is, is waning in Ireland and Poland, and particularly, obviously, in Britain. Um, and this kind of starts to get to the point of, like, what is the essence of the state and what is the state at its root? What about when it cannot use these indirect means to make itself uh, known? And obviously, as we've kind of already said, like the state is a weapon aimed at the working class, acting in the interests of the ruling class of capitalism. You know, it does have many uh, weapons and doesn't always need to resort to violence or extraordinary methods. Um, but in the most extreme cases, the state is armed. It has its armed bodies of men, which Engels talks about. And this is ultimately how the state, as a committee for managing the common interests of the whole bourgeoisie, kind of enforces its will. When we think of the state, you know, we do think of like a lot of things, you know, there's like, you know, the Department for Work and Pensions and various regulatory bodies, the courts. But ultimately, the only reason anyone listens to these bodies or does what they say is because you can be thrown in jail if you don't. And obviously, that's what it gets at, is that the essence of the state is those armed bodies of men. And as Lenin uh, explained, when the state arises, that special force is created, special bodies of armed men. And every revolution shows us the ruling class strives to uh, restore special bodies of armed men which serve it. And we can actually see how prophetic Lenin's uh, words are today to the current situation with the policing bill. He says special laws are enacted proclaiming the sanctity and immunity of the officials. The shabbiest police servant has more authority than uh, the representative of the clan. And obviously the clan being how society was organized before class society. And it's in capitalism, as the product, productive forces have developed and they've become monopolized into the hand of uh, fewer individuals, the state has basically become a collective body of capitalists and looms over an increasing kind of body of wage laborers. Um, the modern state is an organization in which the bourgeoisie maintain the general interests uh, of the capitalist mode of production against encroachments, whether that be mostly by workers or by kind of like rogue individual capitalists. In normal times, the ruling class can kind of shroud the apparatus of organized uh, violence behind mottos such as kind of to serve and protect for the police. Uh, but at times when the class struggle is sharpened, kind of that veil of mystery is lifted and we see what the state power for what it actually is. You know, the police themselves are the paid security of the capitalist class. Initially, they obviously functioned as strike breakers to break up the struggle of workers against the new capitalist state. Uh, and they continue to play that role, repressing kind of mass movements such as Occupy Black Lives Matter and they've done that kind of uh, historically um, as well. And these are all kind of just uh, examples of how, you know, the state enforces its decisions by threat of force. And that is the essence of the state. It is a weapon of class struggle. And this is why Marxists come down so firmly against the idea that such a state can be reformed in any way. 
obviously through history, um, people have attempted to capture the bourgeois state and use it in the interests of the workers. Um, I always think the best example to say is it is in Chile, you know, in the 1970s, you had, you know, the program of Allende and the popular unity, and they were voted through parliament. Um, and obviously their program, you know, it was by no means like, you know, revolutionary or um, Marxist in any means, but it had national planning, you had nationalization of the copper mines, agrarian reform, and as well as the kind of the extension of like social security. So, you know, benefits and things like that. And this program, although kind of reformist, was too far reaching to be compatible with US imperialism and even kind of the local capitalist class. Parliamentary blockades uh, and reactionary propaganda didn't deter the workers from supporting uh, Allende. And even then, the Allende and popular unity tried desperately to compromise with the bourgeoisie. And uh, right up until the end, Allende tried to negotiate with the parliamentary representatives uh, of the bourgeoisie. But whilst like those negotiations were happening, the capitalists were basically planning his murder um, and itself resulted in the kind of fascist dictatorship of Pinochet um, and it was the armed bodies of men of the capitalist state that killed Allende. He tried to capture the state uh, and use it against the ruling class but in the end it was the bourgeois state that captured and killed him. Uh, you know a more recent example, you've got in Peru today, you know, pa Pedro Castillo, who himself is a socialist and won the elections promising major reforms and essentially has kind of capitulated straight away. He's invited the right wing into his cabinet and as well as pro-business groups, the centrists, and is basically also trying to distance himself from the more radical uh, elements such as uh, Peru Libre. And of course, the bourgeois have not ceased their campaign against uh, Castillo and what he represents. You know, they've launched a relentless campaign to destroy his cabinet with basically all means at his disposal. You know, it's got the secret services, the army, the navy, the judiciary, and obviously the capitalist media as well. Uh, and in this kind of campaign, you've got a broad spectrum of forces, including those apparently on the left uh, and sectors of the union bureaucracy kind of acting in a united front against him. And this kind of just goes to show you can't serve two masters. You either capitulate entirely and act against the interests of the workers, as most reformists do, or you place power into the hands of the working class and break from the bourgeois state. You can't just take the tools built by and for the purpose of a minority to rule over the majority. And obviously, as we know, the state is tied by a thousand threads to the bourgeoisie. You can't hope to gradually cut these threads one at a time. And uh, a comrade used quite a good metaphor um, when they explained this to me. You can't pull out a tiger's teeth one at a time. You pull out the first one, you're going to get your hand bitten off. And like you say, you get, you've get cut that first thread between the bourgeoisie and the bourgeois state. You get booted out or you get killed. And as Lenin pointed out, you know, these reformists, they imagine that class struggle can be replaced by class harmony and that simply the workers can be elected to positions within the capitalist state and somehow transform it from within. Uh, this is purely utopian and obviously as we know sometimes even the best most honest politicians uh, can be corrupted in those conditions and I think maybe the most pertinent example I can think of is AOC uh, in America. Uh, but when class struggle rears its head, and as it has, the state and its armed bodies no longer hide behind that serving and protecting. They show kind of their real face. Uh, they're handed a free pass to act with impunity, simply because if they couldn't, the state would not be able to function. If the state could be genuinely accountable and not stand above individuals, it would be a useless weapon in the class struggle. If the state is the product of these kind of class antagonisms, if it is a power standing above society, it is clear that the liberation of the oppressed class is possible only with a revolution, with the destruction of the apparatus of the state power, which was created by the ruling class and which is the embodiment of that alienation. And these institutions, they're set up to perform a certain function, and that is to hold the exploited class in subjugation. No matter what individual fulfills the roles within them, um, for their own careers and advantage, they have vested interest in maintaining the state for what it is. And, you know, it's not a matter of having more nice or more diverse policemen or more judges from working class backgrounds. The state cannot, or the bourgeois state cannot be reformed, and it has to be smashed completely and replaced with the rule of the working class. And obviously the question of what the bourgeois state will be replaced with should occupy a greater part uh, of this discussion. It's not enough to simply repeat the state must be uh, abolished and would be irresponsible to not discuss then what it should be succeeded by. 
And because we understand that the state is a product of uh, kind of class antagonisms, if we do succeed in taking control of the means of production and taking over the running of society, those class antagonisms don't disappear. You know, irre irreconcilable differences will exist. The bourgeois doesn't disappear once the majority of workers seize power. They seek to wrest back control, and they have every time they've tried to take power uh, for themselves throughout history. So a worker state must exist as a tool of the working class in the struggle against the bourgeois class, but it will be different. It will be a weapon of the majority rule over the minority. All this means is that the working class needs its own state apparatus only to suppress the resistance of the exploiters that are the capitalists and only the proletariat as the majority can direct and carry that out. Otherwise, society will be consumed by that uh, antagonism. You know, in every revolutionary situation, workers have created their own institutions of power, which become the basis of worker states, you know, in the Paris Commune uh, in 1848 and the Soviet councils, which arose uh, from the struggle of 1905. And obviously the Russian Revolution consisted entirely of giving real power to these bodies. Lenin's rallying cry, after all, was all power to the Soviets. And these revolutions also have and will need defending, but not by taking up the standing army of the bourgeoisie, but by replacing them with the armed people and destroying the bourgeois monopoly on violence with democratically accountable bodies. But this isn't just a utopia, this has actually happened. You know, in Russia, the Military Revolutionary Committee was under control and accountable to the Soviets, which were obviously themselves councils of workers. Um, in the 1920 wave of factory occupations in Italy, trade unions organized uh, kind of red guards for factories to defend against the police and army. And obviously more recently in Minneapolis, uh, the police were forced out of the city and the NAACP organized armed patrols and they replaced the police in essence. And obviously they were much more uh, accountable. They weren't just individuals with, with guns. They were accountable to their uh, communities and had very like rigorous processes of uh, making sure that they were people with weapons, but that they were accountable. And obviously the worker state will also be a transitional form to so social ownership, uh, which is socialism. You know, state, uh, state ownership is uh, over the means of production is that transitional form. But this state ownership will be uh, qualitatively different because the state itself won't be a bourgeois one. The state won't be in a strange body, but simply a means of kind of organizing, planning, distributing uh, the necessities of life by and for workers. Under such circumstances, the material conditions can be built up to proceed to a classless society uh, where the intermediate form of state ownership is transformed into real social ownership of the whole of humanity. When we all have access to the necessities of life and can live a fulfilling life free of coercion when at last the state becomes the real representative of the whole of society it becomes basically unnecessary and as Lenin says as soon as there is no longer any social class to be held in uh, subjection as soon as class rule and the uh, individual struggle for an existence based upon the present anarchy in production with the collisions and excesses arising from this struggle are removed nothing more remains to be held in uh, subjection nothing necessitating a special coercive force a state but the abolition of the proletarian state and of the state in general is impossible except through this process of withering away. It can't be abolished by a simple decree. Um, the state will only wither, wither away once the proletariat begins to dissolve the functions of the state and bring the forces of production into collective and social ownership. But they can only do so once they realise what the state represents, and that is the dictatorship of one class over another. And to ensure the transition to social ownership requires the repression of the class that you uses the productive forces to generate profit and to exploit people. And obviously one of the main lessons of the Paris Commune, as I already mentioned, which Marx and Engels then subsequently added to the Communist Manifesto, is that we can't simply take up the bourgeois state uh, and use it for our own uh, means. You know, it's been developed to ensure the domination of capital and uh, that's its function, basically. Um, the commune had to be uh, a, not a parliamentary body. It had to be both kind of executive and legislative uh, at the same time. And it was a real qualitative step forward uh, of how we can understand what dictatorship of the proletariat is or can look like. You know, the commune replaced the, uh, the state machine with fuller democracy. They abolished the standing army. All officials had to be elected and all were subject to recall. And all of them were only paid a worker's wage. 
Uh, and it signified a gigantic step forward with the replacement of kind of bourgeois into a proletarian democracy. Um, and from, you know, the transition or at least began the transition from a state into something which is no longer the state kind of proper. Um, and this in turn begins the process of eliminating the bureaucracy of the state. While it would still be necessary to suppress the bourgeoisie and crush their resistance, um, this organ of suppression, however, is that has to be under the control of the majority of the population, not a minority, um, as was always the case in previous class societies. And since the majority of people themselves suppress their oppressors, a special force for suppression is no longer necessary. In this sense, the state begins to wither away. Uh, capitalist development in many ways with its kind of intense division of labor has actually simplified the functions of the state um, and it's become so kind of simplified that it can be reduced to just very simple uh, operations you know accounting um, and things like that which can easily be performed by anyone on a regular wage and basically stripped away of kind of any grandeur or prestige um, and you know we don't have to call it a state if you know you don't like that word um, but the working class must be organized in its resistance of the bourgeoisie and uh, and it must plan the economy in some way if the revolution is to survive a day as we see kind of like following the french revolution you know the disarming of the workers was actually the first commandment of the uh, bourgeoisie once they kind of took up the helm of the state hence kind of after every revolution won by the workers if they don't ensure the permanence of their own rule a new struggle begins ending with the defeat of the workers by the bourgeoisie and counter-revolution. And, you know, such a degree of uh, democracy that we are talking about, that we want, implies overstepping the boundaries of bourgeois society and beginning a socialist reorganization. And we're talking about a state in which everyone participates in its running. And, you know, if everyone is a bureaucrat, then no one is. The state offers no special privileges to careerists who fetishize the state in pursuit of their own elevation within society. And the development of capitalism has actually already created those preconditions that enable all of us to take part in the administration of the state. You know, if we were to rationally plan the economy, everyone could work two or three days a week. And with plenty of time left to consider how, you know, questions of how the economy and society should be developed. And the Commune, the Paris Commune, provided a heroic example. It was a worker's state, and it was a lever to begin uprooting the economic foundation uh, upon which the existence of classes existed. And the dictatorship of the proletariat is essentially this point I'm trying to get at, is a necessary part of the transformation from capitalist to communist society. You know, a socialist, uh, socialized eco economy would eventually be owned by all, and then class uh, distinctions and antagonisms would be abolished. So the state would wither away because there would be no need for it. And it will begin a transition to a communist society, which we'll see kind of. Uh, the replacement of kind of an administration of people, which is what the capitalist state does to the administration of things. Um, and basically, hopefully, a struggle for survival will, will be removed, which will allow that. And, you know, at that point, people will then be capable of living and regulating their own existence and interactions. Um, and obviously, they don't need policemen to tell them what to do. Um, and we don't, obviously, as Marxists just say, uh, abolish the police or the state, um, because that's not a serious program for changing society. It's a, a knee-jerk reaction against something that we don't like, and it's obviously very understandable not to like the police and the state. But we do have something that we're for which will arise in the course of the class struggle and which we will connect with and promote as a source of working class pa uh, state power in society and a power that can actually overcome uh, the capitalist state power. Um, and, you know, we are now at this stage uh, in development of production in which kind of the uh, existence of class exploitation has not only ceased to be a necessity, but it's actively become a hindrance, you know, and the classes will wither away once as once they arose, you know, the state is going to go with them as well. As Engels says, uh, the society which organizes production anew on the basis of free and equal association of the producers will put the whole state machinery where it, where it will then belong into the Museum of Antiquities next to the spinning wheel and the bronze axe. But the suppression of the bourgeois state by the proletarian state is impossible without a revolution, without the initial smashing of the bourgeois state. Um, today, the state is on the surface, uh, at least, incredibly uh, organized and armed to the teeth, and it will defend the present order by any means necessary. 
So Marx's theory of the state is uh, inseparably bound up with the revolutionary role of the proletariat in history, and the culmination of the role uh, of the proletariat. Uh, with, well, the culmination of their role of the proletariat in history is proletarian dictatorship. The political role uh, of the political rule of the proletariat as a ruling class. And as a result, if we are serious about revolution, we too must be organised. In the coming period, the working class will meet the state head on again and again. But it will not be victorious without a, a leadership at its head that understands the state, uh, understands that it cannot be reformed, but must be destroyed and a new state built to defend working class rule. <laughs>